Welcome back. In this lecture, we will talk about chapter 3 of Franklin's book, where he argues that free will is incompatible with determinism. I'm very excited about this chapter, so let's jump right in. In the first part of the lecture, I will talk about Franklin's main argument for the incompatibility of free will and determinism, which he calls the no opportunity argument. But to understand the argument, let's first review Franklin's distinction between abilities and opportunities. According to Franklin, a trained pianist who is stranded on a tiny island still has the ability to play the piano because he has the skill and knowledge that's required to do so. But he still lacks something required for succeeding at playing the piano, namely access to a piano. And for this reason, Franklin says that the piano player who's stranded on a deserted island lacks the opportunity to play the piano. So for Franklin, being able to do something in a strong sense, you need both the ability and the opportunity to do it. And Franklin argues that abilities are intrinsic properties of agents. So that is, what abilities an agent has only depends on the agent herself and not on her environment. So if two people are atom for atom identical, then they have the exact same abilities regardless of what environments they are in. But they may not have the same opportunities since opportunities are extrinsic and so what opportunities you have does depend on your environment. And so Franklin argues that the free will requires the ability to do otherwise. So you do something freely only if you could also have not done it. And doing otherwise, according to Franklin, requires both the ability to do otherwise and the opportunity to do otherwise. So you need to have the normative competence to consider different reasons and then act on them. And you also need to have the opportunity to exert this ability, namely normative competence. Franklin's key thesis then is that the opportunity to do otherwise that is relevant for moral accountability and so free will is incompatible with determinism. In other words, we lack free will if determinism is true because we then never have the opportunity to do otherwise. And so we need to say a little bit more about opportunities and it will be useful to first say a little bit more about how Franklin understands abilities. So a very fit person has the ability to make what one in basketball calls, I think, a slam dunk, which is the ability to jump, is the ability to jump up and put um, the um, ball from above through the basket. But suppose that this particularly very fit person we see here has actually never made a slam dunk in his entire life. But suppose the person still has the general fitness, intelligence, and good coordination such that we think he still has the ability. He just has never actually exercised it, but he does have the ability to do it. And so one reason why we would think that the person has still the ability is because it's possible for him to succeed. Even though he has never tried, he still has the kind of physical fitness and intelligence, as I just said, such that given these features, it's possible for him to succeed. And another way of saying this thing, um, speaking the way how philosophers like to talk, is that there is a possible world in which he succeeds at making a slam dunk. But Franklin thinks that it's not enough that there is just a single possible world in which the person succeeds. After all, even I, I might succeed due to dumb luck a single time if I jump it right at the exactly the same moment and my muscles contract exactly the way they have to. So Franklin thinks that abilities require reliable success. So for a person to have the ability to make a slam dunk, there must be a whole range of possible worlds in which he successfully does so. But that is not all, according to Franklin. We also have to be careful at what possible worlds we look at. For example, there are possible worlds where our athlete is even fitter than in the actual world or even stronger than in the actual world. Or there are worlds where the laws of gravity are different. 
But success in any of these worlds where either the athlete is stronger and fitter or where the laws of nature are different don't show that the athlete has the ability in the actual world because that's not part of the, act of the circumstances in the actual world. So Franklin thinks that we should only look at possible worlds that have the same laws as our world and where the agent is intrinsically similar, so roughly as strong and as fit as in the actual world, because only these worlds are representative of the agent's abilities in the actual world. And Franklin calls these worlds that are representative of the agent's actual abilities accessible worlds. And <clears throat> don't worry too much about the word accessible. It's a technical word from modal logic, and it has like no intuitive meaning. It just picks out the representative um, range of worlds. And that gets us to, um, <clears throat> to Franklin's complicated sounding definition of when an agent has an, has an ability. So basically, an agent has an ability to perform an action such as make a slam dunk if there are a range of possible worlds that are, have the same laws of nature as the actual world and where the agent is intrinsically similar and where he successfully exercises that ability. So that's the definition of abilities, but we will be mainly concerned with opportunities so we have to also look at Franklin's definition of opportunities, but it's good that you already understand the definition of abilities because his account of opportunities will be similar. So I'm now switching examples from basketball to piano player, since um, that's Franklin, one of Franklin's own examples for opportunities. So when do you have the opportunity to play piano? So Franklin again uses the framework of possible words and accessibility. So he thinks for opportunities, it's enough if there's a single accessible world in which you play the piano. But of course, just as for abilities, we now want to ask again, what makes a possible world in which you have a certain opportunity, in which you do something accessible in the sense relevant for opportunities? And that's going to be a bit tricky. So it will be helpful to compare two different agents, Alice and Carol. So Alice doesn't play the piano, but she stands right next to a piano. But still, she decides not to play, and so she doesn't play. Carol also doesn't play the piano, but in contrast to Alice, for Carol, the only nearby piano, the only piano that's at all in her, <clears throat> that's anywhere in a, anywhere in a 5,000 miles radius, is surrounded by, um, by a wall that she cannot get across. So intuitively, we want to say that Carol doesn't have the opportunity to play the piano, but Alice, it seems, does have the opportunity. And intuitively, Carol lacks the opportunity to play the piano because the wall is a decisive obstacle um, against doing so. Carol's playing the piano is incompatible with the fact that the only nearby piano is surrounded by a wall that she can't climb over and that she also can't destroy. Let's assume that. So the only possible worlds in which Alice plays the piano are then worlds that either worlds where the wall is absent or where Alice is um, stronger, is intrinsically different from the actual world in that she is stronger or where there are different laws of nature such that either due to her increased strength or to a difference in the laws of nature, she can somehow make it across the wall or destroy the wall. But the important point is that any world where um, Alice is intrinsically similar and that has the same laws of nature is one where the wall is lacking. So intuitively, the wall is an obstacle towards playing the piano. But now go back to Alice. Alice does not play the piano, but we think she had the opportunity to play the piano. But now notice that in Alice's fact, in Alice's case, there are also actual facts that are incompatible with her playing the piano. Let's take the actual fact that in the actual world, Alice never touches the piano. And Alice not touching the piano is incompatible with Alice playing the piano. And as a consequence, the only possible worlds in which Alice plays the piano are ones that differ from the actual world in that Alice touches the piano. But how then is it different 
from the case of the wall. In Carroll's case, we thought that the wall was a decisive obstacle to, towards playing a piano because the fact that the wall is there in the actual world is incompatible with her playing piano. But it also seems that in Alice's case, the fact that in the actual world she never touches the piano is also incompatible with her playing piano because it's logically inconsistent to not touch a piano and still play the piano. But then what's the difference between the actual fact that Alice doesn't touch the piano and the fact that in Carol's case, there's a wall between her and the only piano? So Franklin needs to distinguish real obstacles, such as the wall, from what we might call fake obstacles, the fact that Alice in the actual world never touches the piano. And notice that the logical fatalist, the person who's impressed by logical determinism, will think that there is no difference between Alice and Carol. The fact that Alice, in fact, never touches the piano shows that she cannot touch the piano and so cannot play the piano. But Franklin doesn't want to be a logical fatalist. Franklin doesn't think that no one could ever do otherwise under any circumstances. He just want to wants to show that determinism is incompatible with doing otherwise. But he wants to keep it open that in non-deterministic worlds, agents could do otherwise. And though Franklin offers a theory of what distinguishes real obstacles, like the wall, from fake obstacles, like the fact that Alice doesn't touch the piano in the actual world. And his explanation is that in Alice's case, the fact that she doesn't touch the piano is something that, it's, uh, that is up to her. So Alice is not touching the piano is something that's under her causal control. In a world in which she decides to do differently, um, she will touch the, the piano as a causal consequence of her deciding to do different. So in other, world, in other words, whether she touches the piano or not depends on Alice's decision. And so in a world in which she plays the piano, she touches the piano because of her decision to do otherwise. But the same is not true for the wall. Whether the wall exists or not doesn't depend on Alice on Carol's decision at all. We've been supposing that given the laws of nature and Alice's intrinsic properties, she cannot climb over the wall or destroy the wall. So in worlds where the wall is absent, this difference on the actual world doesn't depend on what Alice does. It's not caused by Alice's decision. And that's different from the case of Alice, because in any possible world in which Alice plays the piano, her touching the piano is caused by her decision to play piano. And then we get Franklin's general theory of opportunities. So you have the opportunity to play the piano if there's a possible world where you play the piano and where any differences between the possible world where you play the piano and the actual world are such that they depend on the agent's decision that they obtain because the agent did do otherwise. And that distinguishes Alice's case from Carol's case. And that's written into this rather complicated definition Franklin gives of opportunities given op called opportunity star. So he has the opportunity to perform an action which he, for which he uses the Greek letter phi at a certain time, if and only if there's a possible world in which you do perform the action and everything except you performing and every difference between this possible world W star where you perform the action and the actual world is such that it depends on you performing the action. We now have all the pieces in place to appreciate Franklin's no opportunity argument. But first we need to do a brief review of determinism. So if determinism is true, then the actual past together with the actual laws entails the actual present because it entails all states in the future. Or putting it differently, if the actual world is deterministic, then any world that has the same past and the same laws as our world is like our worlds at any time, including the present. But it follows from this definition of determinism right away that any world, that if our world is a deterministic world, then any world that has a different present from our world has to have either a different past or different laws. That follows simply from the fact that if determinism is true, then the actual past and the actual laws entail the actual present. So if the present is different, either the past need to be different or the laws need to be different. 
So keep this implication in mind. <clears throat> and now we go back to our person who is in fact not playing piano. So suppose Alice does not play the piano, therefore depriving you of a great deal of pleasure. So is Alice morally accountable for not playing the piano and so causing you grief? Did she have the opportunity to do otherwise and play the piano? So according to Franklin, she only has the opportunity to play the piano if there's a possible world where she plays the piano and that is actually, and that is otherwise exactly like the actual world, except for facts that depend on her doing otherwise, that depend on her doing the piano. But we've just seen when reflecting about determinism that if the actual world is deterministic and Alice doesn't play um, piano at the actual world at present, then any possible world in which she, contrary to what she actually does, does play piano at the present moment, needs to have either different laws than, than the actual world or needs to have a different path from the actual world. But Franklin points out that neither the past nor the laws of nature depend on our actions in any intuitive sense. The past is over and done with. It's not caused by anything we do now. And the laws are not the kind of things that depend on any person's will. And so the argument shows that no one in a deterministic world ever has the opportunity to do otherwise because the only possible worlds in which we can do we, we do otherwise if the actual world is deterministic are ones where the past or the laws of nature are different. But then there's a difference in this world from the actual world that doesn't depend on what we do because the past and the laws of nature are not the kind of things that depend on our actions. And so the no opportunity argument is a straightforward argument for the incompatibility of free will and determinism. And note that the no opportunity argument only depends on four assumptions. First, we have the principle of reasonable, or reasonable opportunity from the previous chapter, which says that moral accountability and hence free will requires a reasonable opportunity to do otherwise. Then we have Franklin's definition of what it takes to have an opportunity, which is opportunity star, and which I've talked about earlier. And then we only have these further two assumptions, which we might call fixity of the past and fixity of the laws. And that's simply the idea is that the past and the laws of nature do not depend on our actions. So the past is not the way it is because of our actions. It doesn't depend on what we do. It's already over and done with. And the same for the laws. The laws are not the way they are because of our actions. They are independent of what we do. And so to reject Franklin's argument, you would have to reject one of these four assumptions. And so my question um, to you is, which premise would you reject? Which of these four assumptions can the compatibilist reject and why? What do you think? Talk to you soon.